But when I thought of Kay Boyle, I think of Kay Boyle, and I think of someone who was born witness to the most traumatic and shattering events of our century, not simply this particular era, but of the whole 20th century, starting early, both as a creative artist as well as being there. So we think of Kay Boyle immediately as the golden girl of the 20s in Paris with the artists who were there. She knew Joyce. You name them, Duchamp, uh, young Hemingway. She was there, this girl out of Cincinnati, and she was writing. You think of Kay Boyle in Europe, pre-Hitler Europe, just as fascism was about to take over in the Spanish Civil War that some say was the overture to World War II. She was there trying to celebrate the Republicans who fought Franco and fascist Spain, as well as Hitler and Mussolini, while the rest of the world stood by. She, among other of the few artists, was there. And you think of Kay Boyle continuing post-war, the Cold War, the McCarthy days. Kay Boyle again, challenged and defying witch hunters. You think of Kay Boyle in the 60s, teaching at San Francisco State, defying another hunter, Hayakawa, who was the head of San Francisco State. Um, being on the side of who? In every event, with youth, with the young. I got my tenure while I was in jail, thank you. <laughs> Must have been somebody's mistake. Let me set the record straight at the very beginning. First, uh, Ms. Kay Boyle, the distinguished author and member of our English department, was not fired this morning, as was rumored. All I did was to point my finger at her when she was part of a screaming mob uh, to tell her that she should be ashamed of herself. Thank you very much for what you have said. I'm glad you were giving me this honor before, because you might not wish to give it to me after my lecture. <laughs> as for the past, the recovery of the self was what we were seeking in Paris in the 20s, although we never gave it such a grand sounding name. Our daily revolt was against literary, literary pretentiousness, against weary, dreary rhetoric, against outward, outworn literary conventions. We called our protest the re revolution of the word. There is no doubt that it was high time it took place. We had discovered that the work of our American 19th century authors, of whom the whole world thought so highly, was not American at all. With the magnificent exceptions of Whitman and Mark Twain, our 19th century writers had never for an instant been free of the English tradition. There was then, before the 20s, no lively, wholly American, grandly experimental, and furiously disrespectful school of writing. So we had to invent that school. I never understood what the lost generation meant. I don't think Gertrude Stein could explain either what she meant. She, she, said and wrote a lot of things that she didn't know what they meant. After realizing what they did to uh, the myth of the Paris in the 20s, I just wonder how we can believe anything at all that's written about past times. But we didn't sit around in cafes talking about our work at all. I think if anybody had mentioned his or her work, everyone else would have got up from the table and walked away. The only people as I think I mentioned to you before, the only people who came in relaxed in the evening were uh, the painters, Picasso, and they would work all day and then come out and drink and talk in the evening. And they were much more political than most of the writers there. One night he was in a bar, Hemingway and McAlman were in a Jimmy's bar drinking, and uh, McAlman was much smaller than Hemingway. And he had also paid for Hemingway's entire trip to Spain. And he had to have a bottle of scotch a day, aside from everything else. And that night at the bar, he suddenly got mad at McGowan for something and told him to come outside. And then he knocked him down. He was not an endearing person somehow. I mean, no, nobody liked him very much. You think of a coarsened aspect to our life that we have accepted as our life. Cable is precisely the opposite of that. When I spoke of elegance, I meant that, of a certain gracefulness in her language as well as in her being. 
and as well as in, may I add, her politics, too. The librarian, a wonderful man up here, said to me one day, do you know that you're in the Encyclopedia Britannica? I said, what? I thought maybe with a list of people that had been in. There I am, all by myself. K. Boyle, American writer. It, it was very easy for someone who was older, who has gone through a great deal, to look upon them and say, oh, God, hopeless. Not with her. She maintains a certain kind of, I wouldn't say optimism in a Pollyanna sense, but a certain kind of vision that she hasn't lost. He wrote me, he said, I remember what you said to all of us. You can't write by learning the technique. You have to have a belief. It doesn't matter what the belief is. You have to have a belief. What mine was, I suppose, in belief in people and belief that people in the end are all going to be constructive and as they should be.